Welcome to this online presentation in which we will discuss um, how to critically appraise uh, randomized control trials um, and we'll use uh, questions from a, a specific template um, on critically appraising studies around therapy. So there are a number of questions that we'd want to ask when um, critically appraising studies around therapy. Um, the three main questions uh, center around um, the, the methodology. Um, so are the, are the results of the study valid? Uh, the second set of questions revolves around the actual uh, study results. So what are the study results? And then the third set of question revolves around the um, generalizability or, or applicability of the, uh, the study to a, uh, a specific patient. So the first question that we'll concentrate on is, uh, was the assignment of patients to treatments randomized? So it's a fairly obvious question. Um, uh, hopefully if, if it isn't a, a randomized controlled trial, um, we, we can identify that it was obviously randomized, but we want to be a little bit clearer than that um, and seek out what type of randomization process was actually um, implemented. Um, so a simplified randomized approach, um, whether um, there was any allocation to the randomization as well. Um, and, and that leads into the uh, second question, was the randomization list uh, concealed? So um, as we've previously uh, discussed, um, when we're uh, talking about blinding investigators, we also want to blind at this randomization uh, stage as well. So just to ensure that um, selection bias isn't an issue. So in, in terms of these two questions, um, we want to identify uh, what was the randomization uh, procedure that was used. So i.e. A, um, a computer generated random uh, number table was, was identified, but also how the randomization procedure um, uh, was implemented, i.e. You know, uh, an independent um, investigator to the trial allocated patients to either the intervention or control group based on that um, sequence generation. From that, we can identify where the group's similar at the start of the trial. So hopefully if uh, the randomization process has been true um, and hasn't been manipulated in any way, um, the two groups, that being the intervention group and the control group, will be uh, similar but, uh, in terms of baseline um, characteristics, i.e. demographic characteristics. Now, sometimes on the rare occurrence, uh, we, we can still see uh, differences in baseline characteristics. Um, and that's not because that the randomization process was flawed. Um, it's just that fluke event. So let's say, for instance, you were to uh, flip a coin in the air 10 times. You would assume um, that you would get five heads, five tails. But if you repeated the process a number of times, um, there's no doubt that you, know, you, you might get a, a, a turn where you have eight heads and two tails. So a fluke occurrence, something deviating from the norm. So it's always something to, to look out for. The next question is whether patients and clinicians were kept blind to the treatment. Um, and this que question relates to performance bias um, and relating to the actual implementation of the intervention itself. So um, if possible was or were the clinicians blinded, but also were uh, the participants blinded. Um, and if so, uh, there needs to be a discussion of, of how this blinding actually the next set of questions uh, relates to uh, attrition bias. Um, so was the follow-up patient sufficiently long and complete? Um, so if, we, if we've got a, a randomized control trial and we're looking at, um, you know, uh, for example, the uh, treatment of osteoarthritis patients with glucosamine, um, we'd be interested in both short-term follow-up, i.e. one to two weeks, as well as long-term follow-up, two to you know, three months or uh, 12 months, 18 months, whatever it may be. So the duration and the follow-up patients needs to be specified and needs to be appropriate for the question being asked. Uh, were all groups analysed in the groups in which they were randomised to? Um, and this is looking at um, specifically intention to treat analysis. So that is, if we had dropouts, um, did the investigators uh, account for those dropouts? And if so, did they also account for it uh, for those dropouts using an intention to treat analysis? Um, likewise, what we might have um, are not only dropouts, but patients that uh, cross over. So uh, a patient may, may have identified that they're in the uh, control group um, and um, 
uh, refused to continue the trial unless they were then allocated to the intervention group. Now this obviously has issues around compliance and, and it's something that would be um, you know, essential to know in terms of uh, the methodology of the trial. The last um, type of bias that we're looking at is performance, uh, sorry, is detection bias. Um, and that's why we're asking the question, were study personnel, i.e. outcome assessors, blind uh, to the treatment? So once again, we're, we're um, trying to minimise um, the, the event of, of any manipulation of outcomes and, and, and data manipulation occurring uh, from the investigator perspective by blinding them, ensuring that they don't know whether or not the patient that they're assessing um, was um, allocated to the intervention or the control group. And the last question to identify is, apart from the fact that one group received the intervention and one group received the control group, were they treated for in the exact same manner? And the reason that this question is, is um, very, very important is to identify that if we do see a difference in results, that is you know, a, a beneficial outcome in the intervention group um, uh, compared to the control group, we can assume or we can attribute that benefit due to the fact that the only difference between the two groups uh, was, the, was the implementation of the intervention itself. That is, they were similar at baseline, they received no differences in, in terms of the implementation of the, uh, uh, you know, the, the drug or the treatment or whatever it may have been. Um, there was no differences between uh, dropouts and there was no differences in terms of how. So the second lot of questions re revolve around um, the results themselves. Um, so for studies around uh, therapy and, and randomised control trials, we usually look at um, uh, relative risks or risk ratio. So the obvious question is, well, what is the relative risk? Secondly, how large was the treatment effect? So looking at um, you know, a relative risk reduction or uh, a number need to treat, um, can you can identify how large the actual uh, treatment effect was? And thirdly, how precise were the was the estimate of the treatment effect? I.e., what were the confidence intervals um, of of the uh, of the of the outcome that we're uh, interested in? So in terms of measure of effect, um, uh, as mentioned, um, we can use relative risk um, or variations on relative risk. So whether it be relative risk reduction, absolute risk reduction, or number needed to treat. In this example, we're looking at um, a, a hypothetical case in which we're uh, measuring uh, lycopene um, versus other, other vitamins um, in the reduction of uh, mortality from uh, cancer. So in this case, 1% of patients uh, randomised to the lycopene group um, died, died um, from cancer as opposed to 3.5% in the other vitamins group. So in order to calculate relative risk, um, it's simply intervention divided by control um, and we get our relative risk of 0.28. Now, for a relative risk, if there is a relative risk of 1, um, this indicates no difference uh, between the intervention group and the control group. Generally speaking, if the relative risk is less than one, it's indicative of the uh, intervention or the treatment being beneficial. Um, and conversely, if the uh, relative risk is above one, um, then this would indicate that the uh, control or the comparison is beneficial. So in this case, we've got a, a relative risk of 0.28, which is less than one, which would indicate that it is beneficial, but it's, it's often fairly difficult to try and explain what a, a relative risk of 0.28 may be to a patient. So this is where relative risk reduction comes into effect, um, and it's simply just one minus relative risk. So in this case, it's 72%. So in this case, we may, may be able to um, communicate that by saying um, the, the risk of dying um, from cancer is reduced by 72% um, in patients who are treated with lycopene as opposed to those patients who uh, receive the um, other vitamins group. Absolute risk reduction is merely just the simple difference between outcomes in the uh, intervention and control groups. So in this case, um, it's 3.5% minus 1%. And the reason why that is useful um, is that it's useful when calculating our number need to treat. So unlike relative risk and relative risk reduction, number need to treat actually takes into account the absolute risk. So, so there's no point in, in someone saying, well, if you take lycopene, your risk of dying from cancer reduces by 
when in fact my baseline risk of dying was 1% or 3.5%. So there's not a huge shift in it. So if we look at number need to treat, based on this uh, hypothetical scenario, uh, we've got a number need to treat of 40. Uh, that is, um, we, we would have to treat 40 patients with lycopene uh, in order to prevent one person uh, from, from dying. Another way in which we can look at that is graphically. So once again, we've got our, our relative risk. So in this case, we've got our relative risk of 0.28. It is less than one. So this would indicate that it is beneficial. So the intervention in this case, lycopene, is beneficial. And here we have our confidence intervals, which tells us about the precision of our study. So uh, we've got our 95% confidence intervals. So basically this is saying is that this is the relative risk that we've identified. And we're 95% certain that it lies somewhere between this point being 0.14 and this point being 0.58. So the larger the so, uh, sorry, the larger the uh, sample size of the study, the more precise or, or the closer or smaller these confidence intervals are going to be. Uh, the smaller, generally speaking, the smaller the, the sample size, the larger these confidence intervals are going to be. So we're not going to be as certain about the result. Another key thing to identify is that these confidence intervals in no way cross. Uh, the line of no effect or, or the relative risk of one. So because these confidence intervals don't cross or don't include one, we can uh, identify that there is a statistically significant difference between the two groups because of that. So not only um, is our relative risk uh, less than one and beneficial, uh, we can identify that the, it is statistically better or statistically more significant in terms of uh, lowering mortality outcomes than our uh, comparison group. Finally, how can I apply the results to the patient care? Uh, we have a, a four, four or so uh, questions. So basically we want to identify um, how similar the patients in the study were uh, or are to our particular patient or patient group that we're interested in. And once again, this relates back to the inclusion criteria. So if the inclusion criteria in the study is fairly specific, um, it can limit to um, how generalizable the results can be. The second question, is the treatment feasible in your setting? Um, so you know, it, it's great having a, uh, a wonderful intervention which uh, reduces mortality or whatever the case may be. However, if it's too expensive or, or not available in, let's say, you know, a, a rural setting, um, then the um, application of it is going to be fairly limited. It's also important to consider a variety of outcomes. So usually with, with randomised controlled trials and studies around therapy, we're, we're interested in a primary outcome in which we're trying to prevent a bad outcome. However, we want to also ensure that other clinically relevant outcomes were considered. So most commonly this uh, refers to adver adverse or, or side effects. Um, so if, if people are taking lycopene, great. Um, were there any side effects associated with it, i.e. Uh, nausea, gastrointestinal uh, issues, whatever else it may be. And the final question um, tries to sum it all up. So given the fact that we've assessed the uh, methodology of the study, we've identified what the results are and we can uh, see how applicable or not applicable uh, it is to our patient, this question is asking, is it worth it? So do the overall benefits outweigh any um, potential limitations or, or harms or risks associated with the study?